Yeah. Hello. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to today's uh, endocrine grand rounds, and we are very happy to have Dr. Kling uh, present today. I'm not going to introduce her or anything. I, I know everybody knows her. I, I just wanted to thank her for the years that she has worked on um, kind of arranging the molecular endocrinology uh, topics for us. It's, uh, it's a great help um, because she uh, knows the topic, she knows the people who can present it, and we have greatly benefited uh, from the presentations from people that she has uh, brought in, and also, of course, uh, for her own presentations. Uh, also, she was very generous to move her talk from last week to this week because Dr. Powers couldn't come this week, so we moved it to last week. So uh, we are very happy that um, that um, you know uh, visit went well. So without much delay, I'll have Dr. King present her talk. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right. So today, as you can see, I'm going to talk about polychlorinated biphenyls and how diet modify the mouse liver epitranscriptome. And I wish you a happy St. David's Day. Today is his day, this patron saint of Wales. Oh, I did something. There we go. Um, there we go. So I have nothing to disclose. So I did have some learning objectives that um, I put on the um, announcement for this talk. We're going to look at the pathogenesis of, of NAPTL, but I think that endocrinologists here know all about NAPTL. Um, we're going to recognize how PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, act as metabolism and endocrine disrupting chemicals. We'll look at the epitranscriptome and what that means. And then I'll, I'll go through some of my data on mouse models of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So again, as endocrinologists appreciate better than anyone, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a growing problem in the United States and worldwide due to the epidemic of obesity. But we now think that metabolism disrupting chemicals contribute to that diet-induced metabolic change, to those diet-induced metabolic changes that propagate and manifest. So in, in just fatty liver, we have cytosis, we go over here and use this little pointer. Um, and then there are further changes that involve inflammation and um, hepatocyte injury, which is called ballooning, that go from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease to NASH. And yet this is all under the umbrella of NAFTL, which includes progression into cirrhosis where there's increasing fibrosis. And of course, um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a part of the spectrum of metabolic disease disorders in uh, people. We also know that there is a greater or a higher prevalence of NAFTL in um, men compared to women. And I always am asked, well, hmm, what about the percent of progression from steatosis to NASH? And so this just shows that, in fact, this um, pathway can go either way at first because patients can progress with um, fat deposition in the liver to fatty liver and then progress to NASH. But some proportion of patients um, with diet restriction and other modifications of lifestyle can regress into to, uh, simple steatosis uh, and potentially back into normal liver, but others will progress on ultimately to cirrhosis. Now, Matt Cave, who is in the Department of Medicine and, and the Division of Hepatology, has published over 20 papers on PCBs in liver as a disease model. And this work it has human relevance and that he and his colleagues in the Anniston Community Health Survey Study have shown a significant association between 35 um, particular substituted PCB congeners and liver disease in the human population. And his model is that hepatic signaling is disrupted by PCB. So normal liver is controlled by metabolic and endocrine signals, but that in the presence of PCBs, this disrupts the signaling capacity of the liver. And this includes the fact that he has shown in his work with Josiah Hardesty have shown that PCBs can inhibit epidermal growth factor signaling in hepatocytes. 
And this will ultimately lead to what he calls toxicant-associated steatohepatitis, which is a combination of metabolic and endocrine signaling and high-fat diet and PCV exposure to toxicant-associated steatohepatitis, which is just a, another form of NASH. So what are PCBs and why do we care? Well, polychlorinated biphenyls are persistent organic pollutants. So we all have a body burden of PCBs, particularly within our adipocytes. There are 209 different PCB congeners, so they can chlorinate chlorine molecules on this biphenyl ring. If they're planar, um, they're called dioxin-like, and they interact with the aryl hydrocarbon receptors ligands to activate that ligand-dependent nuclear transcription factor. So this is uh, PCB126, which is one of the congeners that we used in our experiments. And then we have Aerochlor 1260, which is actually a PCB mixture, a 99% of non-coplanar um, congeners. And Aerochlor PCB126, uh, uh, it, it actually mimics the, P, excuse me, Aerochlor 1260, mimics the PCB accumulation that is found in human um, ad adipose tissue. And instead of activating the aryl hydrocarbon, Aerochlor 1260 constituent congeners can activate CAR, constitutive androstene receptor, PXR, uh, and inhibit EGFR signaling. Now, the manufacture of PCBs was banned in 1979, so long ago, but these um, chemicals, because they're persistent, continue in the environment. So this is the Great Lakes. Uh, and what we can see is that in water and in sediment, they're, they're enriched for PCBs. And so this is where Buffalo is, and this is where Rochester is in New York State. And so they're contaminants in food, particularly they're associated with fat soluble. So they're in meat, they're in dairy, and they're in fish. And again, they're associated with steatohepatitis in uh, named data. Now, uh, Matt Cave and his colleagues have an environmental toxicant um, induced model of steatohepatitis, and that they um, think that high fat diet collaborates with PCB exposure to uh, allow disease progression in this model of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this uh, contributors to this um, environmental insult are the whole expososome, which includes the microbiome and the virome. And I hypothesized that maybe PCB exposures in the context of high-fat diet would modify the chemical modifications that occur on RNA that ultimately regulate the transcriptome and the proteome, and thus pathways that are involved in the progression of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease to NASH or TASH. And so we actually got an R21 grant that just ended yesterday uh, to, to look at this hypothesis. So what's the epitranscriptome? There's over 330 chemical modifications that can take place on transcribed RNA. So this is all kinds of RNA. This is mRNA, ribosomal RNA, link RNAs, tRNAs, all the RNAs that are transcribed. And it can occur on any one of the four bases that are indicated here. And what you can appreciate here is many of them are methylations. Now, M6A, which is N6-methyladenosine, is the most common um, uh, epitranscriptomic mark in transcribed RNA. But yet, in mRNA, only 0.1% to 0.14% of A's are actually modified with that methyl group on the sixth position. So it's only an average of three to five M6A sites per transcript. So these are rare events in the, the transcriptome, and yet they regulate the processing of mRNA, as we shall soon see, as well as uh, the function of tRNAs and ribosomal RNA. So Dr. Cave's lab um, and his PhD student, Jian Zhen, his postdoc, Ben Rita Walling, uh, technician, Kim Head, uh, developed and used a short-term high-fat diet exposure of mice uh, also exposed to a single dose of PCB who develop NASH or PASH. So in this model, eight-week-old male C57 black six mice are on a high-fat diet, so 42% fat. And after two weeks on this diet, they're given a single oral gavage of either corn oil, which is the vehicle control, or Aerochlor 1260, 20 milligrams per kilogram, PCB 126, 20 micrograms per kilogram, 
or the combination of both Aerochlor and PCB-126 at the same dose. And all these concentrations um, ultimately end up in the mouse to mimic what humans uh, uh, have as body burdens of these particular PCBs. So then the mice have another 10 weeks on the high fat diet and they're euthanized uh, after six hours of fasting and their liver tissue is processed in various ways. Uh, to use a multi-omics approach to understand the progression of uh, fatty liver to um, NASH. And so prior to um, my joining in this project and trying to look at the epitranscriptome, uh, Dr. Cave's group had already done a protein extraction for LC-MS-MS to identify the proteome in these uh, four groups, the control, the Aerochlor 1260, PCB-126, and the combination exposure. In, in my lab, uh, Kelly Peel isolated microRNA, um, pen per group, uh, to perform microRNA sequencing to identify all the microRNAs and how they're affected by PCB and high-fat diet exposure, so the myrome. She also isolated RNA and uh, after depletion of ribosomal RNA and poly-A selection, performed RNA-seq to identify the mRNA transcriptome. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is that we used five samples from each of these four groups to identify global RNA chemical modification for global epitranscriptome by LCMSMS, and this was actually paid for by a CIEHS um, P30 center grant medium voucher. Uh, and the work was performed in the um, CREAM core, which is the Center for Regulatory and Environmental Analytic Metabolomics, and it's headquartered in the Schumacher building on the Belknap campus. And the work was performed by uh, Li Qing He, who is a postdoc in uh, Dr. Xiang Zhang's lab, uh, and he's the director of the CREAM core. So what did we see? Now, these data were analyzed by Shesh Ra and Jean-Min Tan, who are in the Bioinformatics and Biostatistics Facility Core of the CIEHS P30 Center. So we identified 10 RNA modifications in, in total liver. So this includes ribosomal RNA, tRNA, mRNA, leak RNAs, all the RNAs. It's not just mRNA. And so I've, I've given it some color coding. So in the yellow, we see the modifications that were detected in the Aerochlor 1260 exposure uh, exposed mice, in, and this is all in the liver. And we can see that AM was increased and M6A was decreased. And then we can look at, and none of the other changes are significant. Um, what we can see is that in PCB-126 exposed mice, all the modifications were decreased. And in the Aerochlor 1260 plus PCB-126 exposure, co-exposure group, what we can see is AM is increased and M6A is, is increased. So we detected two modifications that are expressed in the liver in response to PCB exposure that are um, common between all exposures, but the direction of their um, abundance is different. In other words, they're all down in PCB-126 and yet, AM is up in uh, Aerochlor 1260 and up in the co-exposed, whereas a, uh, M6A is down in the Aerochlor 1260 and then up again in, in the 1260 plus PCB-126 co-exposure group. So this is different from either alone. So there's complex interactions uh, going on here. Um, AM is in tRNA and uh, short nuclear RNA, whereas M6A is in all kinds of RNA, rRNA, tRNA, mRNA, and U6RNA, as well as link RNAs and, and microRNAs are their primary transcripts, primary microRNAs. So what regulates um, M6A uh, deposition? And the answer is that there's a writer complex, including the metal-3, which is the catalytic en enzyme, which actually attaches that methyl group from SAM, the methyl donor, uh, onto the adenosine at a particular 
ribonucleotide stretch called the RATCH sequence. So that A is actually the target of the metal-3 enzyme, but it's in this big complex of proteins. Now, this is reversible and dynamic, Mark, so there's actually eraser proteins that can remove that methyl group. And then in the nucleus, as well as in the cytoplasm, there are readers. So these are proteins that recognize that M6A mark and determine the fate of that transcript. So here we're looking at mRNA. And so um, depending upon the reader recognition of that M6A mark, we can have expedited mRNA decay. So if we are degrading the mRNA, we're not going to make protein. Uh, we can have stabilization of the transcript. And in other words, that would help us make more of a particular protein. It can expedite translation. So again, we would expect more uh, of a particular protein in response to uh, the M6A mark on the transcript. Um, and then I, we did some uh, integrating of multiomics. So I wanted to look at the expression of the readers, writers, and erasers of the mRNA, uh, of the RNA modifications that we had detected, and look at whether they were increased or decreased in the different uh, PCB exposure groups. We have four PCB exposure groups, excuse me, three PCB exposure groups versus the control group. And we can look at transcript abundance and protein abundance. So we see some agreement and some that, that don't seem to um, agree. And we don't know because, uh, as I said, the readers, for example, can either increase or decrease the um, stability of a transcript or, or its translation. They're also involved in splicing. I didn't mention that. So uh, the conclusions from this part of the presentation are that this, we, ours was the first study to identify global RNA epitranscriptomic changes in the livers of mice that were exposed to high-fat diet and PCBs that cause hepatic steatosis and um, fibrosis. So this was a unique observation. Um, we've identified 10 uh, alterations in RNA uh, epitranscriptomics, and we saw uh, the abundance of AM and M6A was different between the PCB exposure groups. And um, I didn't really get into it, but we saw that decreased M6A in PCB126 exposed mice and M6A in the combination exposure groups were associated with increased readers, uh, YTHDF3, DC2, and FMR1. And, and we were able to publish this in 2021. Now, a limitation of this whole work is that we don't know um, the location of these post-translation transcriptional modifications in global RNA. So we don't know if this is all tRNA or rRNA, which are the most abundant uh, transcripts in the global uh, RNA isolation. Um, as I mentioned, we also looked at the microRNAome, all the microRNAs that were identified as changed with the three PCB exposures, Aerochlor 1260 PCB 126, or the combination thereof. And we also looked at the mRNA transcriptome. So we could ask the question, do changes in the transcriptome and the myrome correlate with changes that have already been reported um, by the CAVE group in this high-fat diet and PCB exposure-induced model of NASH? So actually, Belinda Petrie, who's a PhD student in the lab, and she's hoping to defend in, in April, um, looked at the mRNA seq data to identify the transcriptome and the miRNA seq data to look at the myrome. And so what we have here in circles in this Venn diagram is the aerochlor exposed uh, samples, so these are the mRNA changes that we observed in the transcriptome, and then the PCB126 exposed animals. Again, all this is going to be versus vehicle control. And then the air 1260 plus uh, co-exposure to PCB126. So overwhelmingly, what you can see, there's a lot more gene changes in the combination exposure than either PCB126 alone or air 1260 alone. And we see transcripts that are either increased in expression or decreased in expression in these different exposure groups. And we obviously see common uh, as well as unique uh, transcript regulation. And the same is true over here on the microRNA side. First of all, we see many fewer changes in microRNAs compared to uh, gene transcript expression changes. And what we can also appreciate is that, again, we see more changes in microRNAs in the combination Aerochlor 1260 plus PCB exposed mice uh, compared to each exposure um, alone. 
then um, Belinda also integrated the mRNA and protein interaction to look at whether we could detect transcript changes that were associated with protein changes, because we know transcripts make protein, right? And um, it was surprising if we look at the number of differentially expressed genes versus differentially expressed proteins in the air 1260 exposed mice, we find only one transcript and protein are common. Um, for PCB126, genes, proteins, seven in common. Air 1260 plus PCB co-exposure, we see 56 in, in common, just if some of them are, are indicated here. So this means that um, this integrated mRNA transcriptome proteome analysis shows low concordance. So when you have a transcript, it doesn't necessarily get made into a protein. So there must be some other regulation of transcript translation into protein. Well, we know that um, microRNAs regulate the, trans the um, proteome because microRNAs work by interacting with the three prime UTR by base pair binding within the RNA induced silencing complex to decrease translation by blocking ribosomal entry and therefore translation. So if you have an increase in a microRNA, you expect a decrease in its target if the microRNA binds and causes that translation to be blocked. On the other hand, if you have a decrease in the microRNA, you might expect to have an increase in its target proteins because you're losing that interaction of the microRNA with its three prime microRNA response element, and therefore the translation should occur. So um, Belinda looked at reciprocal microRNA, mRNA interactions. So the first group um, identified here is where you have a gene up and the microRNA down. So that would be this situation. Um, and she identified this number of differences uh, in, in the different uh, PCB exposure groups. And then uh, gene Group two is where we have the what we would think of as the usual pattern uh, where we have a gene down and a microRNA up. That's most of us think about microRNAs this way. MicroRNA is up, the target is down. And so there were actually none in that Eric 1260 group, eight in the PCB group, and 75 in the combination exposure group, Eric 1260 and PCB co-exposure. Again, we're seeing most uh, changes or um, uh, reciprocal relationships in the co-exposure group. That's because that's where we saw the most microRNAs and the most gene changes um, versus the vehicle control. We can also look at what pathways were associated with these reciprocal relationship, and it included immune response signaling, signal transduction via the JAKSTAT pathway, notch signaling, P53. Now, these first three are definitely associated with um, changes in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So then we wanted to validate these um, microRNA uh, gene targets. So if we have, again, if we have an increase in microRNA, we expect an, a decrease in a target because that will activate the risk complex to block translation. So what we did was to transiently transfect HEC293 T cells with a um, p mir glow dual luciferase microRNA uh, expression vector into which the three prime uh, UTR microRNA response elements of these genes, NOL3, NOTCH3, SMARC A4, and STM1 were cloned. And what we expect to see if the um, proteins are really targets of the microRNAs that were putatively identified by Belinda in this analysis are real, then the microRNA uh, transfected into the cells should decrease the uh, firefly luciferase activity. So this, this is a, this uh, PMR glow dual luciferase has the firefly luciferase in front of the three prime UTR MRE. So we, if we block translation of the luciferase, we're going to get a decrease in luciferase activity. And um, the plasma, plasmids are round. So on the other, down here is the firefly luciferase. So that serves an endogenous control in every experiment. And lo and behold, we see that, in fact, each of these um, four microRNAs are able to decrease the expression of luciferase in this reporter 
gene assay, thus verifying the inverse relationship that we saw. So these were proteins that were increased in expression uh, in the um, Aerochlor plus 1260 co exposed mice. So we saw an increase in NOL3 and a downregulation of MIR. 7125P, and um, NOL3 is involved in apoptosis. SMARCA4 is a SWI SNF that's a chromatin remodeling complex. It's an ATPase. ATPase is the motor that drives um, nucleosome movement on the DNA, so you can actually get transcription. NOTCH3 is known to be increased in the hepatocytes of, of NAFTL patients, and so we saw it increased in our, in our mouse model, and we saw a reciprocal relationship with MIR-206. And NOTCH3 also increases lipogenesis and activates inflammatory cells in liver, again, hallmarks of NAFTL. Now, on the other hand, STEM1 was actually downregulated, and we saw an increase in MIR-9P, but we've uh, identified this reciprocal relationship that MIR-9P is able to uh, inhibit luciferase uh, activity from the microRNA element that was identified in the STM and 1 3' prime L, uh, uh, UTR. And this is actually the protein staphmin that destabilizes uh, microtubules. And that might be part of the ballooning that is seen in um, NASH. So um, this work has been published in Environmental Toxicology and Pharmacology last year. And our conclusions from this study are that PCB exposures alter liver microRNA and mRNA abundance in pathways that are relevant to NAFTL and NASH. We confirmed the reciprocal microRNA protein targets by this dual luciferase assay that I just showed you. Um, and what we also showed was that integrated transcriptome proteome analysis showed low concordance. So the number of transcript changes and protein changes is discordant. So transcript abundance is not a good proxy for protein abundance in this model. So there must be additional mechanisms involved in the regulation of uh, protein changes that are seen in the progression from NAFTL till to NASH. Okay, so what else could be changed? Well, what about the M6A on mRNA, which regulates splicing and translation and cellular location of transcripts? So to look at uh, M6A transcript abundance, we performed M6A rip seq So that's M6A RNA immunoprecipitation sequencing. And here how, here's how this works. And actually, um, this work was performed by Kelly Peel. So what Kelly did was she took um, liver samples. She took five samples from each of our groups, the controlled the Aerochlor 1260, the PCB 126, and the co-exposure, Aerochlor 1260 plus PCB uh, 126 exposure. And um, she did RNA isolation, and she had to do a lot of isolations uh, to get 300 micrograms of total RNA. And Belinda drew this nice diagram, so it shows the RNA, and that little blue dot is an M6A mark. And then after fragmenting the DNA, she, excuse me, the RNA, Kelly could immunoprecipitate with an M6A antibody. So that's going to bind the M6A, and we're going to purify the M6A containing transcripts or fragments of the mRNA away from all the other, or the RNA, away from all the other RNA. And then we can polyase select and reverse transcribe and send it to the um, uh, Illumina sequencing facility core for next-gen sequencing. And then those data are analyzed by the K. Inbri Bioinformatics Group, headed by uh, Eric Rushka, and Kalina Andriva uh, actually did some most of the analyses that you'll soon see. And so this is what Kalina sent us. And I was thrilled out of my mind to see this because it was such a, it's so cool. So um, instead of that usual kind of, you know, red-green, um, so some people are colorblind and they can't really distinguish between red and green, the um, purple-yellow is thought to be a better um, way to look at data. So what you can see, that you actually can't see the five lines here, but anyway, this is control. This is the Aerochlor 1260 exposed samples. This is the PCB 126 exposed samples. And this is the Aerochlor plus PCB co-exposure samples. And so if you just cast your eyes down, what we can see is there's differences, right? 
Um, so aerochlor exposure changes the number of M6A in certain genes, and PCB126, you know, this is an increase, and in, in the uh, more purple it is, it's, it's a down regulation. So uh, changes, changes, it's all different. So this is the first indication that anybody had ever seen that exposure to um, a PCB and high-fat diet could induce changes in M6A deposition in genes in um, in liver and in any uh, relevant toxicant sample. So very cool. So what does this mean? Well, um, what people do when they get these sort of data is to look at the um, chromosomal distribution of M6A decorated genes, and so that's what I did here. Um, so we have control, error 1260, PCB 126, and co-exposure. So we can see different numbers of M6A genes on, on different chromosomes. Um, uh, Kalina also noted that most of the M6A peaks were identified in the coding sequence in the 3' UTR, and 97% contain, contain the RATCH motif, which is where the metal three is going to deposit that M6A uh, on on adenosine. So oh, methyl, yeah, I said I said that. Okay. Um, so this is all all to the good. And then we can look at the number of genes that have certain number of M6A peaks per gene. And so what we can see as we cast our eyes over this is that there's um, a lot of genes that have a single M6A. Um, less have two, less have three, and so forth and so on. And some even have more than five, and we'll, we'll see more about that soon. But what you can um, appreciate is that the green and the pink, we see more M6A peaks or more genes with M6A peaks with PCB126 or PCB126 Aerochlor 1260 co-exposure uh, compared to either the control or the PCB126 exposure. If anything, maybe PCB126 is reducing M6A uh, deposition in genes. And so um, Kalina put together a Venn diagram to look at the um, number of M6A containing genes and the total number of genes per group. And, and the bottom line is, again, we're seeing the most changes in this Aerochlor 1260 PCB co-exposure group. And again, we go back, that makes sense because that's where we detected the most changes in genes and microRNA. So I think that those, that's really where the liver is making the most, um, is say having the most most changes. And then um, we can use a program called uh, Metacore to analyze what pathways are associated with genes with altered M6A peak densities. Um, and these are the common pathways that were identified for all the exposure um, groups. And, and this is filtered by being mouse, mouse liver, right? And so what do we see? Well, we see fenfibrate treatment of type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome, and this makes sense. Um, protein folding, immune response, um, and hepatocytes, lipoprotein metabolism, and, and you can read this faster than I can say it. But this is consistent with changes that are seen in, in human patients with um, NAFTL and NASH. Um, and next, Belinda made a volcano plot to integrate analysis of M6A containing genes with differentially expressed genes in the Aerochlor 1260 PCB co-exposure liver samples. And so um, at the bottom, what we're looking at is log to fold change. So this is transcript abundance. So these are down-regulated genes on the left of this um, break in the uh, uh, volcano plot, and then increased transcript abundance on the right. And then we're looking at M6A, which is the negative log 10 of the um, false discovery rate. So um, what you can see over here in the legend is that when we have the green dots indicate a lower number of M6A peaks in this dual exposure group compared to the control, vehicle control um, liver samples, and red dots are more peaks, and the size of the dot indicates more peaks or less peaks. Uh, so what we can see is we see an increase in M6A deposition in FZD4 
which is probably about maybe four or three or four. I can't really tell from the from the size. And that's an increased transcript abundance. And yet, here's here's one BCL9. Well, it's got a lot more M6A peaks, and yet it's in the reduced expression. So um, remember that M6A can regulate either translation or increase decay and decrease uh, mRNA stability depending on which reader protein binds to that M6A mark and what cellular compartment that transcript may be located in, whether it's in the nucleus or, or in the cytoplasm. So it really depends on cell context. So this is not surprising, but it's very cool uh, and very, very nice uh, graphic. So then, um, I wanted to look at the top 10 hyper M6A methylated peaks in the liver genes and compare them between the three exposure groups of the Eric Lohr, the PCB126, and the uh, dual exposure or co-exposure model groups. And what we can see here is like some genes have a lot of M6A peaks. So here's a zinc finger transcription factor. It has a lot of peaks. Um, what's interesting here is ApoB. We see ApoB has increased number of peaks, uh, peaks M6A peaks in, in Eric Lohr 1260 exposed samples. We see even more in the PCB126 exposed sample. And then we see something intermediate with the dual exposure, the, the uh, eight exposure. So then we thought, hmm, let's look at what's happening with the ApoB transcript in the mRNA sample. So Kelly did um, real-time quantitative PCR to look at ApoB uh, expression in the mRNA samples, either the uh, vehicle control or the Eric Lohr 1260 or PCB 126 or dual exposure samples. And what we can see is we see a decrease in ApoB transcript abundance with PCB 126 exposure or in the samples um, from the mice that were exposed to both PCB 126 and Eric Lohr 1260. And then she did um, quantitative real time PCR on uh, the uh, M6A RIP samples. And what we can see is we see a decrease in um, ApoB abundance in the dual exposure Eric Lohr 1260 plus PCB 126 exposed samples. And reduced ApoB protein plays a crucial role in hepatic lipid accumulation in NAFTA. So again, now we have a potential mechanism for regulation of ApoB transcript abundance in the liver uh, in NAFTA um, by M6A. Now, whether this is true in human patients, we don't know yet. We have to get some human livers in, from NAFTA patients and, and look. Um, then what we also, so we know, if I go back, right? Okay, there we go. So we have ApoB um, hypermethylated in all three PCB exposures, but different numbers of peaks. So that means that there are different RASH sequences within the ApoB transcript that are differentially decorated with, with M6A. So what Belinda did was to do MetPeak analysis to identify the position of the M6A in RAC motifs in the transcript of the ApoB gene in, in mice. And then she used primer design to uh, flank where the RATCH motif is. So the RATCH motif is bolded and underlined here. And so you can uh, appreciate that the um, central A in this sequence, this is sort of a side-by-side -side one, is going to be the target of metal three, where it's going to put down that um, methyl group and make M6A. And so um, Belinda designed primers. Here's primer set A, and the primers are in this sort of brown color, and B and C. So we've selected three. We know, oops, right, that there are uh, a total, we have identified a total of 10 uh, metal uh, M6A sites in RATCH motifs in this gene. But we picked, but Belinda selected three that looked the most interesting and for which she could design unique primers to look at uh, transcript abundance. So this is um, looking at M6A enrichment. So this is um, RIP. Uh, QPCR rather than RIP-seq, so M6A RNA immunoprecipitation followed by quantitative real-time PCR using these primers. So for ApoB set primer set A, what we can see is an enrichment of uh, transcript abundance with Eric Lohr 1260. With primer B, we see increased transcript abundance with PCB 126 exposure, and with primer set C, 
we see also an increase in uh, PCB one with the one PCB one twenty six exposure. Now, a limitation of this analysis is again that only three of the ten possible sites um, were examined, and other sites may have a uh, greater impact on transcript abundance because we didn't see anything for our dual exposure or co-exposure samples. So next we ask the question, does an increase in M6A peaks alter uh, FZ, FZD4 and A1CF protein? On those volcano plots, actually, um, I think I pointed to FDZ4, they showed increased transcript level abundance and we saw increased number of M6A uh, peaks uh, from 0 to 1 with the PCB exposure and from 0 to 4 with the dual exposure. So we were looking at the dual exposure data in the volcano plot. And ACF, uh, A1CF went from 0 to 4 in the dual exposure and from 1 to 2 in the PCB exposure group. So Kelly uh, did a Western blot to look at FZD protein um, in the Aerochlor or, or PCB126 or dual exposure. And even though this looks like it would be so tempting, but that background is also going up, so there's no significant increase in FZD4 in, this, uh, in these samples. But we did detect an increase in uh, A1CF. This is APOBEC1 complementation factor. It's an RNA binding protein. And what it does is it's, it's essential for the processing of the apolipoprotein B mRNA. So there's two forms of um, uh, APOB, a long form, about 100, and then and a shorter form, like maybe 48 or something like that, that function um, in the liver and in adipocytes. And so this protein is involved in making this stem loop structure to clip uh, the RNA into two forms for, for two um, proteins. So that's, that's, that's what I have to say about that. So conclusions from part three. We showed that M6A modification plays a role in PCB reprogramming of hepatic gene expression in a mouse model of high-fat diet and PCB exposure-induced patch or NASH or progression to um, NAFTL. And this uh, is associated with changes in APOB. Um, the pathways associated with the changes in M6A peaks in all three PCB exposure groups included protein folding, lipoprotein metabolism, bias acid regulation, all involved in NAFTL progression to NASH in, in humans. PCB exposure altered the hepatic M6A transcriptome in a non-dioxin-like versus dioxin-like PCB selective manner. So this implicates um, the proteins with which these PCB congeners associate, namely the aryl hydrocarbon receptor versus CAR, uh, PXR, and EGFR. And we showed the M6A RIP QPCR regions of the APOB transcript harboring M6A peaks um, were validated by M6A RIP sequencing. Now I'm going to switch to a different model. Um, and this is long-term low-fat diet plus aerochlor exposure model of NASH. And so this was work that we did with Kim Head uh, and Van Rita Walling in Dr. Cave's group. And Belinda and Kelly were involved from the very start of the ex this experiment in which Eight-week-old C57 black six mice were put on a low-fat diet, so different from our high-fat diet, only 10.2% fat, and then the rest protein and, and carbohydrate, for two weeks prior to a single oral gavage of Heraclor 1260, the same dose, 20 milligrams per kilogram, and then followed out for an additional 34 weeks for 36 total weeks on this low-fat diet prior to the collection of uh, livers. And during this time, glucose tolerance tests were done, serum was taken, echo MRIs were done. And um, at the time of tissue harvest, after six hours of fasting, um, various physiological parameters or measures were, were taken uh, in the mice, and this was um, performed primarily by uh, Kim Head. And IHC was performed by um, Dr. Uh, Yan Lee, and we'll soon see, see more about that. But also, Kelly, again, isolated RNA, and we sent it off for Illumina mRNA sequencing, and we took the total out. Uh, this is, of course, after processing for ribosomal RNA depletion and poly A selection from mRNA seq. And then the total RNA was again sent to CREAM for LCMS to identify the global RNA transcriptome. Um, 
uh, Kim Head also did some RNA isolation for quanti uh, real-time quantitative PCR. Oh, I got to correct that typo in <laughs> bio, bio render. So this was looking at, okay, before we were using a high-fat diet model, what happens if you have uh, exposure to a low-fat diet, but air core um, longer exposure? E oops. Even though this is a single um, exposure, again, because these are persistent organic gluten, they'll um, sequester themselves in uh, adipose tissue and then um, redistribute throughout the body. And so there's some notion in the literature from uh, Larry Robertson's group that, in fact, over time, concentrations of PCB, even after this expo long-term exposure model, will actually distribute out of the fat and into the liver. And that's associated with that uh, steatohepatitis that we then see. Now, we're actually very interested in doing that, but unfortunately, my R01A1 uh, uh, was triaged, and so um, we don't have the money to send these samples off and determine the PCB levels in, in these livers. But I, I want to do that, so just need to write another grant. Okay, so um, Yan Li uh, did perform the um, IHC analysis of these samples. Oh, and uh, go back over here. Uh, so Kim had ran AST and ALT. We see an increase in AST, but not an increase in ALT in the Aerochlor 1260 exposed liver uh, samples. But we, um, Dr. Lee, did a NAS score, so the NAT. NAFTL activity score. So we see an increase in steato, uh, steatosis and inflammation, but not in ballooning, so we don't see the damage to the hepatocytes. But NAS scores are increased and fibrosis is increased. And this is a, a gene that is a um, fibrosis gene. And we, what we can see is it's increased in real time quantitative PCR. So what happens with the global uh, epitranscriptome? We, we detected more modifications. Oh, you know what I never said was that how, okay, so they're detected by LCMS, MS, but they're actually detected against standard, right? So it's not like these are, you know, invented out of, out of nowhere. Um, so we detected uh, significant changes in 12 modifications. Um, not that I expect anybody to remember because I can hardly remember. I can remember the M6A was changed, but it's a little hard for me to remember the AM was changed. But in the high fat, Aerochlor 1260 exposed samples, we saw an increase in AM and a decrease in, in M6A. So we detected changes in these two modifications here. We saw also a decrease in M6A, but rather than an increase in AM, we saw a decrease in AM. So clearly, diet and Aerochlor 1260 exposure combinations do different things to the um, epitranscriptome. And we saw an increase in IA and IM uh, G14. And then I've put on uh, here as well the kinds of RNA that are uh, that have these modifications and the writers associated with these modifications. Um, as I said, we did mRNA seq, and we found both um, up and down regulated genes in response to the Aerochlor 1260 uh, exposure samples. This is actually um, a fewer genes that were detected than were detected in the high fat diet Aerochlor exposed uh, samples, and we can do or um, uh, Dr. Kapani De Silva, uh, Julia Charkar, and Eric Grushka's group can do um, gene ontology, biological processes analysis, see what changes we see um, here, and with the Aerocore 1260 long-term exposure model. And then, of course, I like to do Metacore analysis. So I looked at um, low-fat diet control versus Aerocore exposed livers to identify what are the um, uh, pathways that are changed in response to Aerochlor 1260. So again, we see some things that we would imagine to take place in a mouse model of NASH, or at least NAFTL, stellate cell activation, immune responses, signaling uh, changes. Um, and then um, going back to this NAS score, we could really separate the Aerochlor 1260 uh, exposed mice into two groups depending on their NAS score. So those animals who had a low NAS score and those who had a high NAS score. Now I'm really curious is if somehow there's more um, PCB in the livers of these mice versus these mice, even though they all receive the same oral um, dose. But I don't know. I've, I would think that that might be true. That would be my hypothesis. But nonetheless, we can also see in this high NAS score uh, group, they have an increase in, in body weight and have higher cholesterol. 
so something is different between the high NAS exposed mice versus the low NAS and control exposed mice. So some of the data that you'll see, we're going to focus in on this high NAS um, group of Aerochlor 1260 exposed mice. Um, going back to the epitranscriptomic changes, since the liver M6A is reduced in the Aerochlor 1260 exposed mice, I wanted to know if the readers, writers, and racers were changed. So, um, um, so we could integrate the differentially expressed genes from the mRNA seq and looked at the transcript abundance of the 39 readers, writers, and racers. And we found that three readers, FMR1, RBM15, and YTHDC2, are increased. And we focused in on this YTHDC2. <clears throat> and we looked at its protein abundance. And what we can see is that YTHDC2 abundance is increased in the Aerochlor 1260 exposed animals with high NAS scores versus uh, the um, low fat diet uh, with low NAS scores versus the control. So in fact, there's an increase in the um, low NAS score, but an even higher increase in the high NAS scores. So next steps. Well, okay, so what's YTHDF2 doing? It can do two different things. It can increase translation or it can be involved in degradation of transcripts. Okay, so next step is to do eclip. That's where you UV crosslink your protein and your nucleic acids and then do RNA digestion to get rid of most of the RNA. Um, then you IP for YTHDT2 and then you do some steps and you ultimately do RNA-seq to identify those RNAs that are actually bound to YTHDC2 in control versus Aerochlor uh, high NAS livers. I then asked, well, what networks are associated with these um, Aerochlor 1260-induced RNA modifications? So it shows the modifications here. These all modifications were downregulated. And it focused in on uh, NRF2 and the nucleus, which is a transcription factor, and RBJ. Uh, kappa 2. And I thought, well, NRF2 is very interesting, right? Because we know that that's activated in response to all kinds of stressor and oxidative signals, reactive oxygen species, all the bad things that would be going on in the liver um, in response to a uh, toxicant like um, Aerochlor 1260. So in response to a toxicant, we're going to get keep destroyed, and NRF2 can enter the nucleus, interact with its heterodimer partner, bind to uh, antioxidant response elements, and upregulate uh, the transcription of, of genes that try to allow the, the hepatocyte to, to survive. And what we see is, in fact, in the high NAS uh, exposed uh, or uh, Aerochlor exposed uh, livers, we see a reduction in NRF2. And um, Josiah Hardesty in Matt Cave's lab had shown that in high fat diet with Aerochlor exposure, NRF2 protein was, was also uh, decreased. Um, I've already mentioned this, that, that if we look at what are the changes that are common or unique to the different um, air chlor exposure groups, the high fat diet, the first study that we looked at, and now this newer uh, low fat diet exposure. We see two, tra um, two changes in common, but in different directions for AM, but both um, we see a decrease in AM. And then we could also compare the low fat diet control versus the high fat diet control. Now we see a lot of differences here. So this is the first demonstration of diet dependent differences in the liver uh, epitranscriptome certainly of mice and let alone of humans. And um, one of the caveats here is the time, right? So it was only a 12-week 12, uh, 12 diet exposure to high fat, and we've gone 36 weeks to the low fat. So the mice are uh, at a little bit of a different age, and they're like 24 different, different, but they're not that different. It's not like a two-year-old mouse versus a you know, six-month-old. So, But it could be uh, also um, age-dependent. Then I did a uh, metacore analysis of the difference in epitranscriptome differences between the high fat versus low fat diet, uh, just the diet alone. And that centered into NFAT TC4. And this, when I looked it up, because who knows what all these genes are, uh, I found that this is actually an activation hub in NASH. How interesting. And um, PPA5, I had to look up. That's mouse gene APC5. That's acid phosphatase 5. It's an oncogene and hepatocellular carcinoma. And it's high in human intra abdominal adipose tissue in NASH versus steatohepatitis or uh, normal liver.
but we decided to look at um, NFET C4. So well, how NFET C4 is regulated is that in response to the oxidative um, stresses that occur with um, diet or uh, chem here, chemical exposure induced NASH, we have a destruction of this link RNA called Enron and um, a decrease in LRRK4. So LRRK4 phosphorylates um, NFAT4 and keeps it in the cytoplasm and this L Enron link RNA also holds it in the cytoplasm. But in response to calcium signaling, which activates a, a phosphatase that isn't depicted here, or the decrease of, of these two components, NFAT, C4, can enter the nucleus. And there, it can bind to DNA, and it will increase the expression of the cytokine called osteopontin, which is in, increases fibrosis and inflammation, hallmarks of steatohepatitis or NASH. And at the same time, it um, binds PPAR alpha, which prevents PPAR alpha from binding to its response elements and upregulating up um, fatty, fatty acid oxidation. So you get um, a, a, an increase in fat synthesis rather than oxidation. So that would be the, the fatty, fatty liver. So we, of course, did Western blots, or Kelly Peel did Western blots of NFAT C4. And what we found was that NFAT C4 is higher in the nucleus of low fat diet compared to high fat diet uh, exposed, um, treated on diet exposed mice. And when we looked at the impact of Aerochlor exposure in a low fat diet, um, mice versus the high fat diet control. And this, this is nuclear extract down here. It's just nuclear extract versus cytosolic extract up here. Lamin B1 is a nuclear uh, protein. So um, what we can see here is that we see a decrease in nuclear NFAT4 with aerochlor um, exposure in the low fat diet fed mice. So my final conclusions are that long-term Aerochlor 1260 exposure altered 12 epitranscriptomic marks in the, uh, versus the low-fat diet control. We identified 18 marks that were different between the high-fat diet and low-fat diet controls. And we confirmed that there are reduced uh, NRF2 and NFAT C4 with Aerochlor 1260 uh, exposure. Uh, again, the limitations of looking at global transcriptomic changes that we don't know specifically where these um, post-transcriptional modifications are. And that paper has been submitted to um, environmental toxicology and pharm pharmacology. So future directions. Well, what I didn't really get into talking about is that we saw, saw some, I saw something really interesting in the apotranscriptomic table, and that is we identified um, uh, chem um, chemical modifications of RNA that are in solanocysteine tRNA. And this is solanocysteine tRNA. And so we see an increase in M uh, MCM5U and IA. Those are in the um, anticodon arm of the uh, sec tRNA. And this sec tRNA is responsible for depositing solanocysteine in proteins. And we know solanoproteins are um, involved in liver detoxification of heavy, heavy metals and um, toxins. So um, I was um, lucky enough to get a CIEHS medium voucher to test the hypothesis that the observed changes in these specific chemical modifications that are unique to this um, human t sec solenocysteine tRNA um, are associated with changes in solenoprotein abundance in the Aerochlor 1260 exposed mouse liver. So my objective will be to identify solenoproteins in the liver samples, which um, uses the expertise of the omics and uh, omics and exposure facility core, Mike Merchant, um, to determine if solenoprotein abundance reflects changes in the epitranscriptome of the SEC tRNA. And actually, some preliminary data on that, and I'm going to talk about that at the CIHS Cancer Rig meeting next Thursday at noon in CTRB uh, 124. If you're interested in, in coming, you'd be welcome. And I think as I've gone through this, um, I've acknowledged all the people, particularly Belinda, who's um, here today, and Kelly in my lab, um, my collaboration with Matt Cave and Jan Lee, uh, Ben Rita and Kim Head, 
Dr. Cave has many grants and much support, and I have acknowledged the, the grant that has funded the work. And of course, all the RNA-seq bioinformatics were performed by the members of Dr. Rushka's team, and the CREAM Corps actually did the chemical analysis to identify those. Uh, epitranscriptome changes the chemical modifications of RNA, and uh, bioinformatics, Chef Ra and Jean-Louis Penn. And I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Yeah, I have some questions. Oh, let's see. Oh, oh, the code. Right. Let me get that over here. Ah, oh, there's the A cell. Oh. Oh, well. <laughs> it was very in-depth and detailed. Congrats on all the great work. Um, so the impact that you mentioned, is that the one that when you're doing the breast cancer, the line a few years ago, did you have the same uh, impact? That you ah, good question. So, um, Today is the first day of the DOD BCRP breast cancer research program grant looking at epitranscriptomics and endocrine resistant breast cancer. So next year I'll have a different story. I'll get back to my usual, you know, talks on breast cancer. This is, you know, a little bit removed from my primary focus in life, but it's, yeah, well, it's, it's been fun, you know, to come with an idea of, oh, you know, this new way, new, obviously it's ancient, but new to us, new to our thinking about how on um, chemical modifications of RNA can regulate biological processes. And so with that idea, you know, convinced Matt Cave that we should look at this, and then we wrote the grant, got the money, and have done, yes. the, done the study. So these mice are not... Uh... Um, well, the high-fat diet ones are, yeah. So, I mean... But not the low-fat diet. Uh, they're not mice that are... Uh, either... No, no, no lepar, no, 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 no. yeah. Yeah. And the uh, fat in the liver overall, mm -hmm. is that similar? Different. Well, the changes that yeah. you see yeah, are right. related to the amount of fat? Or? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I know the high fat diet mice are a larger than the low fat diet mice on here for 1260. I guess we could look at that. That's a good question. We can look at that body weight. Yeah, but the lean yeah. first um, body weight. We can have that data. Yeah. But I don't believe that would be right. Not, not right. right enough. Right. 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 And I'm thinking because we can go back to um, Jian Jin's data and look at the body weight of the high fat diet mice after 12 weeks versus our 36 weeks. I'm sure it's yeah, higher. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Ooh, actually reversed. Mm -hmm. So we have uh -huh. So the answer is that we'd have to. Um, can we increase uh, the activity uh, of um, the M6A erasers? So in the an environmental thing, uh, exposure, what is the proportion of these different? Because when you when you use just the uh, you know the PCB product, you have different response. Yeah. Uh, how is the in a natural environment that proportion that they would be exposed to? I think that some went yeah. Up and one, some went down. Right, went down right, and right, down. right, right. So the Air Core 1260 because it's a mixture of PCBs that mimics what we find, what people find in, in human adipose is thought to be probably the most relevant. Um, but yeah, I think what Matt would say is that um, people are exposed to um, dioxin-like PCBs as well. So I think his thinking is that actually the PCB-126 plus um, air 1260 co-exposure uh, is a better mimic for what people, uh, for example, in the Aniston cohort uh, have. 
had just said he was trying to log on. Oh. He was a VA. <laughs> So, he sent you the link. Oh. He asked for it, like, send the Wi-Fi was probably Oh, good. Well, he so got to hear something. So, I'm going to get data on these things. Um, factor, maybe you need to deliver or something. Not yet. You need to write a grant. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming and paying attention and asking me some questions. I appreciate it.